So what could have been something very bad for Shangri-La Frontier going forward was easily solved in one of two ways that was possible. The first of which was we have an entire vault of very powerful endgame level weaponry, armor, probably some items. You know, there it was a big vault. There was a lot of ship there. A lot of people assumed Sunraku couldn't use, like, the armor and stuff because of his curse, which could be a decent excuse, but given that I felt like we were building up to a guild, or in this case, a clan of some sort being built, you would just give it to one of the other two, and they would be basically broken. I mean, if you're able to wear armor or use a mount, a steed, that Weathermon was using, that would be broken, and it would make future boss fights very, very difficult. So, if that's the case, I don't really see how that would happen. My assumption was a power source, a key, something. It's basically electric-looking armor. I assumed a power source. So what they ended up doing with this week's episode, after pretty much forming our clan, is they confirmed they can't really use anything from that vault because the power source that would basically activate it is damaged and broken. And as we know now... We need quite the skilled craftsman in order to repair it. So what easily could have been something where you walk in like, okay, well, we defeated something that was designed to either be the last boss or the mid boss out of all these unique scenarios. We are essentially at the starting point of a story for an MMO that once it reaches 100, the next chapter, the next DLC, the next expansion will happen, I'm sure. And instead of just going, oh, you know that cool armor Weathermon uses? Oh, you know that cool attack that Weathermon can do? Oh, you know all these different things that are just going to make a lot of things very easy to defeat? Yeah, actually, they still got a long ways to go. This was the proper way to handle the situation. And while I didn't necessarily believe about the whole armor thing about him not being able to use it, for me, I was like, I kind of feel like, if anything... Even if Sunraku couldn't use the armor because of his current curse, the mount, because it looked like similar mounts that Weathermon was using in that fight, like, he'd be able to use stuff like that. So what's going to be the limitation? Is it just going to be naturally weaker based on your level? There's different balances and checks they could have done, but they needed to do something rather than just give an arsenal of endgame looking weapons, and they did the proper balance, they did the proper checks, and in doing so, we now have our next objective, and as Sunraku did in this episode, he's now progressing once again into another unique scenario of taking an NPC who probably normally wouldn't go down this path unless pushed, and it's going to be interesting to see the type of possibilities they open up because of it. Of course, I have a full live reaction to this week's episode of Shangri-La Frontier over on my Patreon if you want to see my full link of thoughts there over there if you're interested. I mean, you know me, I love this show, I love it every single week, the episodes feel less than five minutes, and... This was pretty much everything you could ask for. I mean, I wasn't expecting it penciled to join up as like a clan or a guild or anything just yet. I assumed that would happen. I thought it would be a couple more episodes minimum. But I'm not complaining that they sat around, they exchanged some information, she got back her skill, the way she explained the penalty system, all that type of stuff is really interesting because it just, I don't know, it feels like you're sitting down with your friends and you're newer to the MMO you're all playing and you're learning about the ins and outs of the system and what they went through. That's kind of what that whole conversation felt like. And as we also saw, we get to see their uh, the notoriety. They pretty much have like a, a max level wanted status for anyone, whether an NPC or a real player it feels like. And they had to run for the hills when that one dude barged in. But I appreciate the most about what they did with that vault so they all saw the vault they all got you know everyone had like a couple of little different things they got from that fight i mean of course we have okatsu who pretty much ended up with the broken power source i assume depending on how you handled that fight it was possible you might have been able to get that power source undamaged but given how they went about the fight it's no surprise it was damaged at least they have like, you know, it's not, oh, we don't know where this power source is and now we have to go in blind. At least there is a general path. We have the thing. We now know we can get a blacksmith to do this. It's just, it's going to be a lot of grinding, a lot of questing, and honestly, that's what you want to see. What's going to be interesting is now, because we're dealing with something that's not single player, things can be balanced on the fly. So if we end up in a situation where they repair the power source, they get to use whether that's them equipping armor or they have an automated soldier working with them, whatever it is. If certain boss fights are going a little too well, like if they clear another unique monster and the game devs are like, well, in this case, if they've already defeated these two and they have all these different abilities and weaponries, maybe we got to rebalance these bosses on the fly to actually make them more challenging. Because as we saw, I think it was in last week's episode, the 
game devs were pretty much like the one wanted it to be like a billion times stronger and if it wasn't for proper game balance Sunraku's crew would have never been able to defeat Weathermon at all so if it does look like things start going a little too easy for them they can up the difficulty going forward and potentially they might have to do that around the second or third you know fight just given how things go but if it still continues to push their shit in then we know the balance is exactly where it needs to but that's kind of the fun thing about everything is that you know we're in a situation where the devs are actively monitoring everything but rather than actively trying to screw them out they're trying to keep it balanced and fair so if it does look like it's becoming a cakewalk obviously we know where they would go with that i did quite like the progression of the unique scenario so obviously as payment for you know being able to give that power source over in order for you to go see if you can get it repaired tell us how you did that because Sunraku is literally the only player who has done this scenario seemingly or at least he's one of the only ones because you know that information it's not out there no one knows how he's doing this so he's pretty much with priceless information yeah well you get to level 20 you survive five minutes you do 200 critical and they're just like this little shit this little shit has to be kidding because how are they going to do that? How is anyone rationally, logically, who is capable? Because the worst thing is probably every instinct in their body says he's full of shit, but they know he's not. That this is the type of nonsense he would do. Look at SLF Theater at the end of the episode. When our boy's making his character and he gets to that, like, the backstory or the intro origin. Throw yourself in the middle of a forest away from everyone. What type of idiot would do... I know an idiot that would do that. Like, that's what they're dealing with, and it was so good, but I like the fact that he did open up because he was literally honest with his scenario, but he doesn't really know the the entire criteria. He did and went through a certain situation in a way no one normally would, so it's like, I mean, I guess good luck, but I'm sure they potentially could discover their own unique scenarios. I mean, hell, Pentagon ended up kind of doing a similar thing with the whole Weathermon quest line by the looks of it, so it's gonna be interesting to see where they take it. But overall, what could have been what is considered a slower episode for a lot of shows like this, coming off of the big action, you know, here's the catch-up. We're having, we're getting coffee and some cakes, and we're just seeing where everyone's current at. We learned a lot about the penalty system, about PKing and how ownership transfers over, why the scales technically weren't hers, so, you know, it was able to give it, and, you know, certain items she wanted to keep, she offered to the scales, which then makes it not hers anymore. It's a lot of information, but it's actually really easy to follow, and it's interesting because had she just given all of her items to either one of them and then accepted her penalty, those items would have just been collateral they would have took it as payment for her numerous fines but by being slain in a peking thing that no longer is hers it would then be over to someone like Siger zero and stuff like that i just like what they did with that and i'm glad to see that our girl is going to be able to tag along and i guess she didn't want it but she is apparently clan leader now which is interesting i thought they were basically doing rock paper scissors to see who would be clan leader like they wanted to win but no ain't no one want that uh responsibility and i guess i kind of feel that especially if we're gonna have to lead two idiots but but you know what? What a great episode. I mean, I had full confidence they were going to figure out a balance for that armory. It was either going to be something like he couldn't give the items to someone or he just couldn't use it right now. Or what I was hoping would be some sort of item or power source they didn't have. And that's exactly the direction they went. And I think that's important for how early we are into the story, all things considered. Let me know what you thought, though, down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new around here. Of course, ring that bell. And like I mentioned, we have that full live reaction over on my Patreon. And hey, while you're over there, I'll also give you a video shadow. So today we got Shadow Murloc, Quisho, Sebastian Price, Jewel, David T, and Brian Van Anger. So I appreciate the support, everyone. Please take care and have a good one.